Hey miners, welcome or welcome back to the channel McNally Money, the new home of power mining analysis. In today's interview, Anthony Power and I are pleased to be joined by Jason Less. He's the CEO of Riot Platforms. They just came out with Q3 earnings. We've got a lot to talk about in today's presentation, but before we do, take a second, smash the like button, you guys. Big help to myself and the channel. If you're not already subscribed, McNally Money, feel free to join and let us know in the comment section below if you're currently holding shares of Riot, what you thought about their earnings and your outlook for the final few months of 2024. Now, with that being said, let's get in to today's interview. Okay, guys, so that's right. Jason Last back on the program, hot off the heels of Q3 earnings that just came out this week. We've got a number of questions sourced from the audience, the viewers here to talk about. But before we do, Jason, thanks so much for the time and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you for having me on, Bryce and Anthony. Always good to catch up with you guys uh, fresh off earnings. It certainly is. Now, earnings isn't the only thing you're fresh off. You just came out with October production results as well. So we might as well start off there. Very strong month, Jason. You guys came out with a 23% increase in Bitcoin mined, uh, 505 Bitcoin, which was great to see. In addition to that, the operational hash rate, which we've been discussing and asking you about for quite some time, 16% improvement, 3.2 exahash, operationally improved in a single month. So phenomenal numbers, in my opinion. Why don't you walk us through some of the highlights in your opinion? Yeah, one of the themes that we've been talking a lot about recently is operational excellence. And I'm not saying we're there right now. You know, I, I think clearly we're not, but that is what the goal everyone around in this company is focused around. So uh, what that means is getting higher and higher amounts of our hash rate that's deployed being utilized on a regular basis in production. And I think we continue to be able to show substantial improvements month over month here. Uh, with the new deployments at Corsicana and improvements that are being made at Rockdale, that's what's driving that big increase that you talked about, Bryce. And in fact, uh, it would be even better, but the uh, I think we touched on it the last uh, time we're on the podcast, the first couple days at Corsicana, the substation was down for maintenance. So that entire site was offline for about two days. And uh, if it wasn't for that, you know, that that's a substantial part, amount of our hash right now. That's our biggest site now. That would have made the results even better. So we're really pleased with what we're seeing at Corsicana. The immersion systems, the micro BT miners, these are all performing very well. Um, we're outside of the four CP months right now. There's less curtailment. Rockdale, you saw an improvement in hash rate as well. It's still not where it needs to be, but we have some very big projects underway that we touched on at our earnings call last week. And those those projects, we believe, are going to further push that site up to operating you know, as close as possible to that deployed hash rate level. So with everything that's going on, um, I, I think we're in a really good position to continue this positive momentum month over month. And I think we're going to be going into 2025 very strong. It was awesome to cross that 500 Bitcoin kind of psychological barrier. You can imagine we were uh, sweating it very closely here down the end. Um, uh, we had some increases in difficulty along the way. But one of the things that we talked about at the start of this year is as a result of our uh, growth plans underway, we were positioned to be mining more Bitcoin per day post having than we were pre-having. And in October, uh, this past October, we mined more Bitcoin than we did March, the first full month uh, before the halving this year. So I think we're going to continue to see momentum. Uh, unfortunately, that difficulty keeps going up. We're slated for once again another decrease, but we're racing against that, getting more and more hash rate online. Yeah, we've, we've spoke on the podcast about the impact of difficulty and People shouldn't underestimate um, how 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 big an impact it has. I mean, the halving we knew was going to re reduce rewards by fifty percent, but if you look at where January uh, production that some of the mining companies and we highlighted uh, a couple of those that are at the sort of like top of the of the league tables in January, and and, and it showed that their production had come down uh, at, at least another thirty three percent on top of the halving. So. Um, You've got to keep up with hash rate, something you've done really well this year. I mean, you've grown hash rate over 150% year to date. 
um, just taking into account today. I had it as 133 at the end of September. That 3.2 um, increase there, you know, takes you even even higher. Um, talking about hash rate, though, you've been transparent in your presentation. Um, we were hoping to see 36 by the end of it. I think you're going to come in at just about 35. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about um, why you've why you've reduced that um, that hash rate target? Yeah, so that is primarily being driven by part of the Kentucky expansion being pushed out a little longer than we thought. You know, the, the great thing about our strategy, something that we've been pursuing for multiple years now is um, through this vertical integration strategy, we have pipelines of different opportunities all the time, some organic, some inorganic. We're working on ways to grow our portfolio of power capacity that we can then monetize with Bitcoin mining. So um, we're always prioritizing and deprioritizing things based on a number of factors. But specifically Kentucky, we had an opportunity to do it as fast as possible, or we had the opportunity to take a little more time and maximize what we could get out of that. And I mean, both in the terms of the total amount of power and uh, what the cost of that power would be. So with, with, with all the other growth that we have going on, we made the decision to think longer term. Let's push this out. Let's get a better deal for ourselves as opposed to rushing, uh, getting it as quick as possible. And you know that has a contributing factor to some of the reasons that our, our 2025 uh, target was pushed out as well. So for 2024, though, our previous target was 36 exahash. The revised target is around 35 exahash. So just about one exahash side. And uh, we're charging forward through that with the deployments at Corsicana. That's continuing to go very well. And uh, some big projects we have underway at Rockdale that are going to increase uh, that, that hash rate by year end uh, on top of that. I'm looking at the photographs and, and they are looking amazing. I mean, we were only there three or four months ago when we were invited down to see the site and buildings A1 and A2 were sort of uh, being energized and building B1 was sort of like, I wouldn't say even it was half complete, but um, B2 was not was non-existent. It was just sort of soil. And we look at those pictures now, and you can see the uh, infrastructure complete. The, outs- the external infrastructure looks like it's completed. Um, waiting for that last 100 megawatts, I mean, is, is it a case of the whole building has to be energised or can part of it be energised as, as we get close to the end of the year? And do you, uh, I mean, obviously, it's part of your plan to energise that building by the 31st of December. Do you have some sort of a, a time frame when you expect that to happen? Yeah, first, it's been remarkable to, to witness the progress underway at Corsicana. You see that picture in our, in our monthly update. That's a picture very recently. That was all dirt at the start of this year. There were no buildings up. The, the substation was not up. So such an incredible push has been done by our team on the ground there to get that side up. That fourth building, building uh, B2, it's technically combined with B1, but you know they're delineated B1 and B2. So all four of those buildings are up now and for all intents and purposes complete. In fact, um, a, a good portion of building B2, the fourth building, is in operation now. So uh, the remaining steps is just commissioning the final electrical systems um, I believe all the miners are already in the tanks or if not imminently going to be completed and then getting those miners turned on and getting them, getting them set up correctly. So the big components, the, 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 the substation, the electrical infrastructure, that is all complete now. And it's just the final steps to getting that fourth building B2 hundred percent online, but a good portion of it in operation already. And I've noticed that the, if you go to the left of the, of the, of the four buildings, it looks like, Obviously, you're going to be. Looks like the next phase is going to be, you know, adjacent to where you are at the moment because you can already see the start of the, the the infrastructure going in at the side of that building, close to that uh, big swimming pool you've got there. Yeah, so you can see uh, in, in our earnings call, we also announced the initiation of the second phase, 600 megawatt, taking that to one gigawatt of capacity. Um, you can already see on the ground some kind of outlines have been laid out of where those buildings will go. It'll be C1 and C2, then D1 and then D2 as um, similar structures to what you've seen. And then um, buildings E and F will be each 100 megawatt buildings that are uh, on the other, I guess, adjacent corner of the the lake there, Uh, Lake lake Riot, if you will. So (laughs) we're moving forward on that. Um, The substation like all these projects is the long lead time part of that. I think you'll see buildings coming up 
2025, but way before that substation is ultimately getting there. And uh, thankfully, we've already ordered that equipment in, in the past, and we're looking to get that in and just continuing to maximize the amount of capacity we have there. But very excited to get the rest of the buildings up and uh, complete that site and get that uh, more and more water inside that retention pond. Is it just, just out of interest? And this is an aside. That it does does the are you able to retain the water there? I mean, I mean, where, if you go back long enough, there's no water in that 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 um, right. that uh, that that we pool, made that like pond. Yeah, that there, that was nothing there. We we created, and that was a lot. Of, that's a lot of work to do that, and um, that in, increased part of the cost on phase one. And I know I talked about it in the past. Hey, phase one was a little bit more expensive because it included these things that service the entire one gigawatt. That's a good example of that. So we've created that lake. It holds, I'm blanking on the number, but you know, tens of millions of gallons of water. And it does two things. One, of course, it collects water that falls from the sky. But we've designed the site where every building, every portion collects stormwater runoff and then flows it back into that lake. So we're taking as much water as we can that falls all over the entire course of Canada facility and putting that into that retention pond. And then we use that to help mist over and cool the dry coolers when the temperatures get higher. So not wanting to waste any drop of water, trying to send it all to that retention pond to make sure operations can run smooth when the uh, temperatures increase outside. Is there is there any sort of like backup plan or do you think actually we've got sufficient water in there and and the fact that we're collecting water throughout the year is enough to keep it going for, you know, an, 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 an sort of an infinite basis. So somewhat to be determined. It, you know, part of it depends on how this immersion uh, technology evolves over time, um, how much heat future models of miners produce, um, what the performance of those dry coolers, the future models that we use, how are, how are they working? Um, that will kind of guide how much water use we'll eventually need. Because of the advancements and all of those things, we're already estimating to use way less water than we thought when we started this project. The estimates have gone way down. So will that retention be enough to cover? It's possible, but we, we do have a few backups, uh, you know, j just in case. So um, it would be great to be 100% sustainable. I think that's th that, that would be a, a home run achievement. But we got some other cool things in the work to make sure we get the water uh, no matter what. There we go. Enough water talk, Anthony. We got a long <laughs> list of questions people want to know here. Uh, now you talk about the having and difficulty, which we've actually talked about e extensively on the channel recently. The difficulty adjustments just continue to go up. One of the big tools that miners have to fight that is how efficient their fleet is. You guys just came in at 23 joules per terahash, putting you in kind of the lower, uh, probably third of miners right now or, or quartile there. Can you give us any specific targets you have on fleet efficiency by year end this year and then next year, Jason? Yeah, sure. So we have actually a slide in our deck on this uh, that kind of goes over our current fleet efficiency and what the forward looking one would be. So right now, as you noted, 23. And then by the end of the year, uh, with our planned deployments, we would uh, improve that to 21.4 joules per terahash. We're deploying all the latest generation equipment However, you know, Riot has been mining for a while. We have lots of 30 joules per terahash uh, miners that have still uh, are, are in operation right now. Uh, many that have been you know, fully depreciated, some still being depreciated. I remember we got our first S19s in, I believe, June of 2020. So uh, a long time running with that series. So that is something that will will make that average efficiency a little bit higher despite the fact that we have all these new deployments coming in but as the new deployments become a more significant makeup of the overall fleet as equipment that's under 20 joules per terahash starts to become a bigger uh composition of our fleet we'll get to uh expected to get to 20.3 joules per terahash at the end of 2025 and then if you assume we fully execute and deploy our micro bt uh uh, purchase order all the options in that order then we would get to 18 and a half joules per terahash but by the end of 2025 uh, a majority of our fleet about 65 percent would be under 20 joules per terahash now remember um the efficiency of the machine our objective here is to use to pay as little for power as possible and, and achieve that unit of uh, hash rate the other component of their 
is the cost of power. So Riot has been very good at demonstrating its ability to achieve a very low cost of power. So that makes us a little bit less sensitive to needing to have the absolute latest generation efficient equipment in order to be competitive, in order to be that lower uh, quartile in uh, direct cost to mine Bitcoin. So something that we're still focused on, but the power strategy is something that allows us to uh, you know, not always need the latest generation stuff in order to be operating at a below break even price. Yeah. In terms of um in terms of the machines, I mean you've obviously you've obviously changed supply, you've gone micro BT. From what you see at the moment in terms of performance, are you seeing a much improved performance of what you had before? Are you are you still finding there's uh, there's nuances with even with you know like people find with all machines, or are you sort of like um you're happy expanding literally, you know, to get to a uh, you know a hundred meg a hundred exahash with using micro BT? We're super pleased with the performance. Um, you know, we didn't go into this decision blind. We tested microBT equipment for a period of time before entering into these longer term purchase orders. But, you know, first off at uh, Corsicana, these machines are purpose built for immersion, which is right. different than how we did immersion in the past. We had to get air cooled miners and we had to convert them uh, to, to work for immersion, which had took time, it took money and it had some complications. It's not a perfect a system up to doing it. Um, MicroBT making the uh, M, uh, 60, M56 and now M66 series miners designed specifically for immersion, that has reduced a lot of complexity in deployments and we're very pleased with the resilience of these machines. That's what's driving a lot of the improved operating performance you're seeing. Of course, CAN is running very solid our average operating hash rate was 11 exahash over October. No, however, we were making deployments over the course of October. So you're really seeing a, a very much more narrow gap between operating hash rate and deployed hash rate at Corsicana than you've seen previously. And it, it's it's a result of, I think, the improved miners that are being used there, the improved immersion uh, systems being used there, et cetera. Over at Rockdale, where we're, we're, we're all we're primarily air-cooled, uh, we're seeing great performance with the microBT machines there as well. In fact, we have one building that is all a microBT M60 uh, series miners, and that building is running at over 95% uptime, even during the hottest periods of the summer, and I'm um, excluding for the periods of power curtailment, of course, but showing super strong operational resilience in lots of conditions. So that has been uh, great for us to see. We've learned a lot through that process, and that has what has led us to take those lessons, expand on them, and uh, in two more air-cooled buildings at Rockdale, we are putting in all of the microBT air-cooled machines, and we think that's going to even even further improve the operating performance of the Rockdale facility as a whole and increase the hash rate there and improve the overall uh, efficiency uh, fleet-wide as well. I mean, obviously, you've got you know fairly new fleets at Corsican. I mean, do you have um? How do you go on for like a, like a, a re repair service there? Do you have a, a good good system with micro BT, or have you got your own uh, re repair uh, team at, at both sites? Uh, it's a combination of everything. Uh, well, first, I'll say micro BT has provided excellent support. Uh, there's lots of little small things that you know sometimes we need tweaked, and they'll help change around for us. They have technicians, they come out uh, to our facility, look, offer advice, help with problems uh, if, if they occur. But, you know, with, with the brand new um, immersion equipment, as you noted, Anthony, that there, there's, there's not too much going on yet. Um, but the broader answer to your question, at both of our sites, we have an on-the-ground miner maintenance team. They're in charge of preparing miners. Uh, we, if we need help beyond that, uh, we use uh, external vendors as well to assist with kind of the overflows and, and repair, repairs that have occurred. That has been a little bit of a bigger expense for us in the first part of this year. But I think now going to the end of the year, that's going to be a lot less significant. And uh, that's a result of, I think, the better performing machines and uh, more capability we're further, we're further in-housing and, and getting better at. Would you say uh, air cool compared to immersion, you're seeing uh, less repairs on the immersion fleet? Um, or are you seeing actually it's 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 negligible between both of them at the moment? 
Yeah, we're seeing less repairs on the immersion fleet. You know, once again, it's still fairly early months here at Corsicana. So we need more data, more time to go on to say for sure. But the stable operating environment, the absence of any type of dust or particulates coming through the air because the machines are submerged, that really helps eliminate a lot of potential problems. So that's one of the main reasons that we're excited about immersion cooling. We think it will prolong the useful operating life of these machines. You know, some people ask, well, do you have data to back it up? Well, I don't think immersion has been around long enough. The technology is changing. There hasn't been enough time for us doing this at scale to, to, to be able to, to back that up over many, many years of data yet. But that's what our, our, at least our short-term data is indicating to us uh, is, is, is how things will play out in the future. So uh, we are pleased with what we're seeing with uh, the uh, immersion results there. And, you know, that maybe ties into another thing that contributed to an adjustment of our, our forward-looking hash rate targets. One of the things you might notice in um, both our 2025 hash rate target and for uh, the hash rate if Corsicana was fully deployed is we decreased the amount of hash rate at Corsicana. Now, why is that? Well, it's not because there's less power there, but we are putting less miners into those future buildings to give ourselves the ability, the option to overclock. So the numbers that you see there in that deck uh, reflect just the default settings of miners. And we're, we're, we're deploying less because like I said, we, we, we believe we're getting a lot of improved performance and we want to leave that additional power capacity open so we can have the ability to overclock. If that's successful, that goes a, a long way in improving capital efficiency. You're buying less miners to get the same hash rate, which is another one of the long-term thesis around immersion and the advantages to it. Now, if that doesn't play out, then we'll just end up buying more miners and we'll get more hash rate anyways. But we're, we're really encouraged by what we're seeing. So we're setting ourselves up to try and be successful there. That's great, Jason. Now, shifting gears a little bit, and that's great insight into the immersion. We we wanted to get some data, and I know it's brand new technology. You're trying different models between the buildings, so it's great to see promising results there. Now, as we've talked about production for October, now we want to shift gears into earnings. So you guys came out with earnings for Q3. Revenue actually increased 65% year over year. However, the company did report uh, a large net loss of 154.4 million. Now, Anthony went through those numbers on our channel. We broke out cash costs versus overall costs. Uh, we know depreciation was obviously a big component of that. So can you walk us through that loss, why it happened and what steps are in place now moving forward? Yeah, so a couple big key drivers to, to that loss, uh, and it's primarily non-cash expenses. As you noted, it's about $60 million in depreciation amortization, um, about $30 million in stock-based compensation. Um, there was approximately uh, $38 million uh, loss on our position in Bit Farms, and then we had about a $25 million loss on our power derivative. That's our power contract, or it's a combination of all of the power hedges that we have, the PPAs, you know, depending on what term you like to use, and the value of those changes quarter to quarter based on what the power market is looking like. Um, I, I, I've seen some people before think it's based on how much time is left on the contracts. That's part of it, but it's more so driven by what the market value of those uh, contracts would be based on the forward curve in ERCOT. So all of those non-cash expenses ended up being big components of what that loss was. Then if you if you go into the uh, SGNA side, we had a few elevated, uh, I would call them one-time expenses, expenses that we would not expect to occur on an ongoing basis running our business the ones that we had occurred recently. We had acquisition costs uh, related to the closing of the block mining acquisition. That was around $3 million. Um, for all of the work that went around um, our initiative with, with bid firms over the summer, we incurred a cost of around $4 million. And then we have some litigation. And so there was some litigation uh, work that increased during that period. And that was the cost for about $5 million. So those are a bunch of things that you know we incurred those impact our financials but uh are, are not necessarily those are not cash costs that are, are necessary to continue running our business 
the, the costs that occur now as a result of MA and litigation. And, you know, hopefully uh, we can get that behind us as soon as possible. The good news is our all in costs for Q3 2024, it was about $35,376 per Bitcoin. And uh, so that includes both power and non power related direct costs. So that's the main thing that we are trying to scale up over a wider, wider and scale as we get more and more hash rate online. We have significantly more hash rate online now than we did over the average in, in, in Q3. So I think that's a real positive catalyst we have for improved results going forward. Um, one thing that's important to note is if, if you look, and we have a slide for this in our deck, our, our direct non-power costs quarter over quarter are improving, which means we're achieving the economies of scale at these sites. Power is the one linear cost that scales with more and more hash rate. All the other costs are non-linear, or I'm sorry, sublinear. So for Q2, our non-power cost per Bitcoin was about 10,000. And then as a result of increased hash rate, that reduced to 8,000 in Q3. So we would like to see that metric to continue to improve. And then overall, with more and more hash rate deployed and meaning more and more Bitcoin being mined as long as long as difficulty doesn't go too crazy, that will continue to uh, that will increase the revenue base and make all of these numbers proportionately improve over time. So a lot we're working at. It's a matter of getting more hash rate online and it's a matter of tying up these other uh, non recurring items so they, they don't continue to impact the financials. Yeah, I mean, I, I use the term probably fixed costs as, as as for the non-energy type costs you've got there because, like you say, they don't tend to change. You're still going to pay your staff. You're still going to pay the other types of bills, your uh, your your legal bills, your um, G and A costs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but yeah, the energy cost uh, is is variable depending on how much Bitcoin you're mining. Um, in terms of going, in terms of some of those uh, G and A mm-hmm. costs, I mean, you mentioned um, you know litigation, and actually, for people who want to look more into this, you've released your ten Q today, so you can go through that. There, it's a couple of hundred pages long, and it's got a whole section on on various things. And all miners do this. It's there's you know uh, everything's in these ten Qs and ten Ks. People, you know, there's no. There's no secrets out there. It's full transparency from all the minds. You're just gonna know where to look for it all. It's all in there. And uh, but yeah, you've got you've got set litigation. We've seen those costs now regularly obviously occur in these last you know few quarters um with with regards to you starting to reduce down your hosting. Do you sort of like see a light at the end of the tunnel there, or is this is this gonna be ongoing through twenty twenty five? You know, like with all litigation, the timeline is totally unpredictable. Um, I, I think we're we're reaching uh, more active parts of these litigation right now, which is why those costs uh, increase during Q3 and for Q4 could could remain around the same levels. Uh, you know, of course, we want to get these uh, behind us as, as quickly as possible for the listeners, for the viewers that aren't familiar. You know, maybe you'll go look in the, the 10Q and 10K at your suggestion, uh, Anthony, they'll, they'll, they'll see at least our, our, our summaries in there of those. These relate to our legacy hosting agreements, disputes uh, essentially inherited with the acquisition of Windstone US. Uh, we inherited these these uh, legacy agreements, and then there's been some litigation that has resulted from those. Not not a whole lot to say besides you know it's unfortunate, uh, but we do also have an obligation to you know to stand up for what we believe is right. You know where we're wrong, we have to push back and we have to. Uh, protect ourselves and collect damages where we have uh, believe we've been damaged. So these are costs that we're incurring as a part of protecting ourselves, part of, part of protecting shareholder value. But ultimately, these are not expenses that we want to continue. So something that we want to wrap up as soon as uh, is reasonably provided for. Now, one thing you know, right, is it, I mean, it's, it's one of the biggest um, self mining uh, Bitcoin mining companies in in North America. But you also have a, an engineering business. And That's for right. those people out there, retail shareholders, who don't really understand what that brings to the company, can you sort of like in, in sort of 60 seconds give them an overview of, of the benefits of having that in-house engineering service um, in terms of what it would, you know, what it brings to the company, what it would save you if you didn't have that service there? So people are aware because people look at business units and think actually it brings in revenue, but its costs are there. Is it, is it, is it, paying for itself. So, you know, to the untrained eye, um, can you just give them 60 seconds of what you think the benefit of that part of the business is? 
Well, I may give you a little bit more than 60 seconds, Anthony. So for uh, for those who don't know, the engineering division is a company called ESS Metron that Riot acquired at the end of 2021. Now, we didn't acquire this company because we were interested about diversifying into electrical switchgear manufacturing, but there were some strong strategic benefits to it. This equipment we purchased at massive quantities in order to build these data centers. So we have some cost savings by internalizing these. We're paying ourselves for these costs and we're, we're getting this equipment that we buy in, in such high quantities at cheaper prices. I would guess that probably around this point, we've saved in the neighborhood of 15 to $20 million. Um, I, I would have to look into it to be sure. Something around that as a result of having this function internalized. But even more important than that is having the visibility on the supply chain, knowing where this equipment is coming through, knowing all the inputs that go into making this equipment, having that resource inside significantly helps de-risk the development of all these new projects and further allows us to customize a lot of things and sometimes at the last second have to make some changes uh, in order to accommodate our specific requirements and have a uh, vendor that's very willing to do that because it's all in-house under that Riot umbrella. So the the, the motivation for the ESS Metron transaction was uh, strategic, not necessarily trying to diversify in, uh, in, into other revenue lines and get a new line of business. You know, that being said, this equipment is in high demand for all sorts of data center, oil and gas uh, generation applications as well. The data center being the biggest bucket of what a lot of the, the business is. So what's encouraging is we see uh, for the the financial profile of that business on itself, we see a lot of exciting things into the future there. Their capacity to bring in these new contracts has been limited as of late because they had a massive government job that was taking up the entire facility. This was, once again, a legacy job that did not have amazing margins, and it took all the resources to do that. Now that job is getting shipped, so there's more, or I, mean, I believe it, it's entirely been shipped at this point, and now there's a lot more fly, floor capacity to come bring in these higher margin projects. And since there's so much demand for building data centers, they need switch gear uh, and all these other uh, types of equipment, um, there's a lot of promising opportunity there. So I think 2024 has been a good uh, turnaround year for the engineering segment getting some legacy stuff behind us, and now is positioned really get great to get some high margin contracts going into 2025. Do you see Do you see this, come, like the, the part of the business supporting other North American miners in their quest to get uh, or build data centers? Or is it, is it, would that be too much uh, a step too far, maybe? No, they, they, they have supplied other miners. Um, yeah, I, I don't know who they are. Um, no, no, it was, you know, we, we, we respect asked. the confidence. We, 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 We've never told them don't serve anyone else. So, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the customers that come in are are the ones that they serve. And, you know, we just know the categories of the types of customers that they have. I oh, asked the king. same question in Nashville, <laughs> Anthony, at the investor presentation. So I guess you and I are on the same page. I said, do you sell this <laughs> equipment to your competitors? And they said, we sell to anyone. Yeah. And they want to, any, yeah. Cash, if you want to pay the right price. Jason, yeah. <laughs> I'm, anyone I'm, who has that? money, yeah. Cash, cash, cash is, is king. king. Oh, yeah, you are right. Um, I, I want, right, so switching gears onto another, this is probably the, the most questions we ever get, and we do bring it up with you, and you do talk it through um, in all the in all the podcasts we've done, but stock-based stock, stock -based compensation is, um, is probably, I don't know, from a retail investor standpoint, is probably one of the most controversial areas. Um, you, you know, I, the theory of it is understandable, um, but... Obviously, obviously, we've looked at, at Riot's uh, numbers and, you know, in terms of revenues for the year and or revenues for the quarter and stock and stock based compensation. And if you look at the nine month period, it's 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 quite significant. But can you sort of like really break it down for us in terms of how these numbers get calculated? Um, who's going to benefit from from this? Uh, what are the metrics to determine this? And and bear in mind um, the metrics. I think when we when I interviewed you back in twenty twenty two, it was based on EBITDA and it was based on hash rate growth, and now it's sort of changed. But 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 to put these questions to sort of like to bed for 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 a, for a time, maybe until the next podcast. Uh, can you give some sort of like uh, 
understanding to the to the retail investors and treat them like the 12 year old so you know um so they can really understand it <laughs> okay so um you know first point that i, I want to make is a stock-based compensation expense the vast majority of that is compensation that's being um amortized it is not compensation that's being paid out i mean th there, there may be some individuals that had you know small amounts of stock that vested during the period but when you see stock-based compensation, that doesn't mean that we were writing checks and everyone was cashing in a, a, a bunch of stock over that period. We are expensing that over a uh, over the period of the award, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit later. So one important thing I wanted to clarify just off the bat there, that's yeah, what that, that's what you see in stock-based compensation there. So uh, you noted how we, we had an award in the past. We had a, um, it had more specific operational targets and what we did is we engaged a compensation consultant and we looked at the different ways that companies create uh their stock-based compensation awards we're looking at market practices because we, we we want to follow the practice that proxy advisors like iss and Gloss lewis are looking for executives to have in their compensation plan and also what large investors like blackrock and vanguard are looking for in uh executive compensation plans as well. There's a whole lot of effort that's focused around this and really all the major companies use consultants to advise them on this data and how to construct these plans. So in 2023, we developed a new type of stock-based compensation program. We call it our long-term incentive plan or LTIP plan. And it essentially is over a three-year period and partially service-based for continuing to serve in the company. And it is also, there is a performance component as well. Uh, in this case, the performance component is significantly the, the biggest part of the award. And it's how does Riot's share price perform relative to a stair, a, um, the stock price index over that three-year period? So there's this three-year performance period over which Riot's share price uh, performance is measured. So that is approximately for the sake of discussion here, is that is the period that that award is being expensed over. Uh, and for the 2023 award, the performance portion, uh, none of us earn until uh, July of 2026. So none of that is paid out. It depends on how the riot share price performs over a three-year performance period, 2023, 2024, and 2025. And then it's, it's measured and vest uh, accordingly at the end of, of that period. So there's a target performance there and then there's an overperformance uh mechanism as well the stock-based compensation is expensing the total amount possible over the target including the maximum amount assuming we just absolutely hit it out of the park and that's expensed over that three-year time period um so th that is why uh you 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 see that continue to mount uh quarter over quarter here and that will probably continue through around 2025. Now, why through 2025? The 2023 award specifically had an increased amount on the performance side because it tied with the development of our Corsicana facility. 2023, 2024, 2025 is when you know the critical parts of building that whole facility came together. So we wanted to make sure we had a team that was retained and very focused on the results of making that happen. So that award, it's not just to our executive team, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of Riot employees all participate in that award. And they are all tied. It was a lot of work to set up the stock administration to get hundreds of people, some who don't even have bank accounts, set up for uh, a compensation for a stock-based compensation program. But we really wanted everyone tied to the success of the company. We wanted them to feel that. We wanted them to share in the value that's hopefully being created as a result of all that hard work. That was for that 2023 award. The 2024 award was significantly less. It was really that 2023 award tying with that critical period. And the 2024 award was significantly uh, less uh, um, compensation values for everyone across the board. Uh, but still part of our program to retain people and layer on these different performance periods over and, and over time. So in short, and I'll, you know, if there's any follow-up questions, let me know. But in short, stock-based compensation is not a paid-out amount. We are expensing 
amortizing over a time period. The the big portion of those awards do not vest until July 2026. And, you know, 95 plus percent of it is, uh, at least for myself, is based on stock price performance. But nonetheless, we are expensing the full potential amount up front. And then if it is unearned at the end, that compensation expense uh, gets reversed at the end. Uh, it gets reversed at that period uh, if it is unearned and the, the shares get forfeited back to the company. All of Riot employees participate in this program. It is a key part of how we recruit and retain people. You, you really want to get the right people that are tied to your vision and mission. You want people that uh, value stock more than they value a salary or cash-based bonus or anything like that. As a public company, that's one of the advantages you have. You have this liquid stock that you can give to employees for compensation. So big award for 2023 tied to the course of Canada development period. 2024 was less. I think you can expect 2025 uh, award to be less as well. However, that 2023 award will continue to be expensed over its performance period through 2025. And I know it's repeated a bunch of things there. I just wanted to emphasize those points. Um, and that is the gist of it. So these are like separate, ongoing, different three-year targets, sort of exactly. like every year there's another another target point in place. I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, I mean, if, if it, so if the 2023 target runs to the end of 2025, mm -hmm. I mean, that's effectively the end of the bull cycle. If, if we look at previous cycles, so, you know, hopefully the share price um, gets a position where um, – shareholders benefit as well at the same time as 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 employees and uh, and directs of the company well that's if previous cycles play out like they have in the uh, in the future um obviously we're, we're bullish on bitcoin and uh we believe as a result of what we're doing we are helping position ourselves for success alongside success of bitcoin we we are a, a bitcoin company here first and foremost that's our our blood and foundation so if that period works out great, you know, then, then so be it. But um, it's if it doesn't, you know, we're, we're still here uh, with longer term targets in mind. Yeah, I appreciate the detail there, Jason. And I know this is kind of a sensitive topic. We get a lot of questions from the retail investment community. We obviously want to ask you those. But at the same time, like you say, this is a core part of your business recruiting strategy. And I know uh, working in a blue chip company, this is a big part of uh, attracting top talent. So we appreciate you walking through that. One follow-up question I did have uh, in relation to Corsicana, actually, and Anthony and I have talked about this on the channel as well. You had a PPA agreement at Rockdale. You chose to go market rate at Corsicana. This has proved very favorable, essentially kind of a fixed versus variable uh, mortgage rate, if you want to draw an analogy. This has proved out very successful for you. Can you give us just a couple of details of why that's worked out so well and, and where you think that may land next year as well? Yeah, so we've got a lot of questions, if you can imagine, leading up into the Corsicana development asking, hey, when are you going to... You get a PPA when you're going to fix your power, et cetera. And, you know, one of the things that we were communicating to people is one, uh, there's a, this is a deregulated energy market. We can procure these hedges at any time. It's not like there's an approval process to get them or anything like that. These things are traded on a regular basis. I could call up right now and, and probably get one probably too late in the day to get one done today, but we could get it done tomorrow if I, if I really wanted to. Um, what we were seeing though, is elevated prices in that forward curve, in these forward-looking hedges, really driven, I think, by a lot of the um, fear for based on power prices seen in the past and the concern that they would remain elevated in the future. That's kept that forward curve up elevated. Meanwhile, we're seeing more generation come online. We're seeing gas prices at um, you know recent lows. So our view was it was not a good time to be locking ourselves into a long-term hedge we have hedges, low-priced hedges at Rockdale, so we, we can do interesting things with our power strategy there. And of course, at Cano, we said, let's start off with just buying market rate power. And you can see in um, October, we were 3.6 cents per kilowatt hour at Corsicana, actually cheaper power than what we were receiving at Rockdale. One of the things about these hedges, or well, at least the critics of Bitcoin mining don't always think about, sometimes they're saying, oh, these Bitcoin miners, they have these, you know, great deals with these uh, low cost power. But there are many times during the year where the price of power, the market price of power is even cheaper than what our a fixed price is in Rockdale. 
but we still have to pay that fixed price. And no, of course, it's a benefit when the market price is higher and you know we, we have the ability to, to trade off that hedge then. But uh, Texas has very low prices a lot of the year. So now by buying market power in Corsicana, we have the ability to take advantage of that. And it's a portfolio approach to power, some fixed and then uh, some market. The other important thing to point out is this is the first year that Corsicana is in operation. It's been ramping up significantly uh, over the course of this year, actually. So because it's its first year in operation, we do not get the benefit of 4CP yet. Uh, That is, you participate in that program, you reduce your load at uh, peak periods, and then you save on transmission costs the following year. Rockdale gets the benefit of that. Corsicana does not. Corsicana, we're paying around $10 per megawatt hour or one cent per kilowatt hour. We sometimes talk about power interchangeably, dollar per megawatt hour, dollar per or cents per kilowatt hour. But um, you see in our most recent update, 3.6 cents per kilowatt hour for power at Corsican in, in October. About one cent of that is transmission cost. So if we weren't paying transmission uh, cost, that would be 2.6 cents per kilowatt hour, which, which is an amazing rate. Wow. Now, we we're participating in Corsicana, at Corsicana in 4CP over the course of this summer, curtailing, trying to hit those 15-minute windows, although you have to curtail more than that to make sure you hit it uh, in the periods of June, July, August, and September. And as a result of that, we believe we'll reduce transmission costs by about, let's just say, 90% uh at at Corsicana in 2025 so really excited about what we're going to continue to be able to do from an energy cost there particularly if gas prices remain low and more generation comes online that keeps those spot prices low and low and you know because we're on hedge we can uh, participate we get the benefit of that yeah Moving away slightly from energy into sort of um, into the your ATMs at the moment, and um, in your 10Q, you highlighted you'd, you'd um, process another ATM in August for 750 million. You've utilized, I think, it's like 230 million of that already, and therefore you've still got 520 million of that. Now, in your presentation, you actually state that you've effectively got your uh, growth. Through through 2025, literally paid for now. Uh, you have significant uh, cash balances. You have other assets that you can liquidate on the balance sheet fairly quickly. You have a, a stack of Bitcoin, um, second to Marathon Digital at the moment, well over you know getting on for eleven thousand coins now. Um, with the with the with the price of some of the mining stocks at the moment. Um, you know, retail investors will be wondering, you know, what what point do we stop selling shares at this low and maybe wait for more favorable opportunities? Um, is there a requirement to continue using the ATM? I mean, I wrote an article recently highlighting this over the last few years, and actually many of the miners have, have used it to great success when you compare the alternatives in going down the debt route. Um, but, you know, dilution is still from a retail investor um, you know, it's an annoyance because obviously their their share of the company gets gets reduced. Um, you know, and, and not necessarily going to get that back with the with the with the share price. Uh, so, if you can just talk, talk through your the thought process of the company as we go through this next sort of uh, twelve to fourteen months. Sure. So, um, as you noted in our earnings deck, we have a slide that shows that the capex plans relative to the targets that we've set out, and the highlight that it's fully funded. In that, under the assumption that we that we would sell all the Bitcoin we mine on, on a monthly basis, we have not been selling Bitcoin on a monthly basis as of recently. There is no hard and fast rule on this. That's just a decision that we 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 make on an ongoing basis. Um, so it, you know that is an important factor that will drive uh, whether or not we need external sources of financing. Is whether or not we're selling Bitcoin. Now, as far as external sources of financing go, of course the ATM has been the primary driver of of funding growth that all Bitcoin miners use. Riot uh, has utilized this. You know, we we, we do have a higher market cap. So these, I think it's important to look at these dilution levels on on a share basis, not necessarily on on dollar basis, the way some present it. Um, So we, we, we are very mindful of how we utilize this there. The good news is there are more financing mechanisms coming around that are not equity linked. Uh, things that we've been working on, uh, things that other 
uh, miners have been doing as well, such as Bitcoin backed loans. The terms are starting to get better on those. They are not as onerous as they were two years ago. I think they had a lot of risk around them. So uh, the good news is there's that and other things that we've been working on behind the scenes that will be alternative sources of financing that will not be as dilutive. And, you know, rounding it back out, of course, we always have the ability to um, sell Bitcoin from not probably not from our stash, but from a monthly production in order to fund growth as well. And we, we have other assets that that we could liquidate if, if we wanted to as well. One of the things that we're starting to think more about is Bitcoin per share or sats per share. So that's something that you want to optimize for, or I should say that we are trying to optimize for over a longer period, not always on a quarter or you know, the quarter basis. Sometimes there are um, there, there's growth you're paying for then that can help in- increase your Bitcoin stash in the future by being able to increase your hash rate and mine more Bitcoin in the future. But it requires maybe something more dilutive up front. These are things we're thinking about all the time, but we, we we, we, we are trying to bring in more tools and thankfully the market is maturing. So there are more tools available to, to miners like us uh, to, to finance growth and not have to rely so much on the ATM. So I think the short answer to your question, Anthony, is, you know, it depends on how the market develops here. Um, obviously, I think share prices for all miners uh, are depressed right now, I- including Riot, of course. So again, one of the reasons why it's great to have stacked up so much cash in the past. Uh, we have the strong balance sheet. If you count cash on the balance sheet and restricted cash, we have over 400 million in cash available to us. So there's not as big of an urgency. So, you know, we we, we, we try to make the best decision that we can. Uh, there's a lot of thought that goes into how we're financing the business on a regular basis. And the more tools uh, in our toolbox to be able to fund growth, the more sophisticated and conscious we can be about that. Quick yes or no uh, question: Would you would you consider buying Bitcoin in the future? Would I consider buying Bitcoin in the future as a well, company? I think as a as Riot as Riot. Uh, well, as a low cost producer, you know the fact that our direct cost to mine Bitcoin is around thirty five thousand uh, for the recent quarter. That is going to be, I think, the best tool for us to accumulate uh, Bitcoin. We are essentially through mining, averaging in dollar cost, averaging in at a price that's less than the market price. So I think that's for us is a more prudent approach as opposed to, you know, doing one one full swing. I don't think purchasing Bitcoin in itself is bad. Obviously, you know, I am a huge Bitcoiner and Riot is here because of Bitcoin. You know, that's simply how we look at it at Riot. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Gotcha. We've kicked around that idea of uh, Satoshis per share before, and it actually allows you to compare and contrast different industries or proxies. Uh, So you could look at the miners versus MicroStrategy or something like that. We've also talked about, Jason, the fact that if our friend Michael Saylor wants to add Satoshis, he's paying full market rate and our mining friends are able to get it at that fixed rate you just alluded to. So uh, great discussion there. The final question Another one we've asked a few times. So when we were down at the facility, the number one question first asked by the analyst community was, will you be getting into HPC? You said, no, at this point, we're not interested. Last podcast, you said, hey, you know what? We've got a lot of power at Corsicana. We, we're we obviously open to hearing options and our phone's actually been ringing more recently. So we wanted to get an update on that discussion. Is the phone still ringing? Has there been any other step uh, on the HPC journey? Yeah, there has been interest. You know, the difference between our most recent conversation and back in, uh, I believe it was uh, June when we got, when you guys came out to Corsicana, um, you know, back then we had not received interest. Uh, We had not received inbounds despite having, uh, pretty, I think, well-known pipeline of power available that we were developing there. And uh, what changed for us is we did start receiving inquiries uh, more recently, and these are discussions that we've had. You know, for us, the quality of the counterparty is extremely important. If if we were to do a deal like this, it would have to be someone that we're certain can finance their growth and is certain is going to be able to honor that contract for many years or you know these are very long-term agreements right so you want to make sure that 
uh, they're going to be able to satisfy uh, those obligations for a long period of time. So getting inquiries from very high quality counterparties, um, you know, therefore kind of opened us up to having these conversations and seeing if there's something here that works. Um, like we've talked about before, the Core Weave Core Scientific deal was a landmark one in this industry. And that is what has, I think, driven a lot of this excitement around Bitcoin miners uh, doing something like AI HPC hosting to get a similar type of deal. We've not seen another deal like that struck in the industry yet, um, but uh, these conversations are ongoing. You know, at the end of the day, we think the power capacity that we have is valuable, and we will monetize that in the way that's in the best interest of shareholders. For us, that um, clearest path has been on Bitcoin mining, as we've seen it so far. Uh, but if the right deal comes together as a result of these conversations, then we have the ability to utilize that power in another way. I think the key thing for us is this vertically integrated strategy and continuing to acquire more pipelines of a uh, large capacity of power. Because you know, I can tell you from the conversations that we have, it's very high quantities of power that are of interest and on a timely basis. Th these large players, they're looking for hundreds of megawatts not tens of megawatts. So you know, th th this is still very early on. Um, I, I don't know what will happen of it, but I'm happy that uh, our pipeline is being recognized and these counterparties are interested in having conversations with us. And we'll see what happens. In terms of Corsicana, because we we already alluded to earlier in the conversation that you already looks like you're preparing for the next uh, you know, uh, you call it C1, C2, D1, D2 buildings, which would take up another effectively 40% of your power. Um, is, there a, is there a point in time where actually we've, we've too far down the Bitcoin mining now to sort of like to change mind or, you know, do you think you've still got, uh, you know, enough time? And actually, do, I mean, you, you've highlighted that one big deal with Core Scientific is the only big deal out there. Uh, a couple of points from that is, is, is it likely we'll see another deal or are we just, do you think we're just being a bit impatient that that, that, that deal's come ahead and we expect every other deal to start falling out the woodwork in, in, you know, in the next few weeks when really these hyperscalers are not looking this year, they're looking two, three, four years ahead of themselves. Yeah. You know, it, it's hard to say. I think these are really big deals that are being talked about here. Uh, significant amounts of capital uh, being deployed. So it's not surprising that discussions, I think, uh, take a longer period of time than, than maybe people would like. You know, I, I think this phenomenon really has kicked off. I mean, what, core core scientific and core we've signed their deal in, in, in March of this year, I believe. So the first the first deal for twenty yeah for twenty uh, megawatts right, yeah yeah back then and then it, it ramped up after that so. You know, I think we're still within the first several months of uh, all the activity around this. You know, you you're talking about rise capacity. Uh, that being built out, I, you have the ability to utilize that capacity, um, I mean, really at any time. Of course, you don't really want to start building new buildings and then divert the power away from it. So uh, the, the substation is the key part there. You have a substation that's in there, and that's providing power then you can develop what you need uh, from there, depending on what a, a customer's uh, desires are, uh, what, I'm sorry, requirements are. So um, I think we still have flexibility with that. There's the ability for something to potentially come together uh, there. But, um, you know, it, it's still very early. And at the end of the day, we're looking for something that is not a huge capital requirement for us. That's one of the key elements that made that core scientific and core weave deal so interesting is them fronting is core weave fronting the capital, uh, offsetting uh, future payments. Uh, we don't want to take on a huge capital expense, and we want a strong counterparty, and we want those economics to beat Bitcoin mining economics over the long term. So, I think the power is the key asset. I think that's a big theme of what people talk about this year. So, not only will we have these conversations. But we are continuing to diligently work to expand our portfolio power capacity uh, to give ourselves that optionality. Let's hope those Wall Street guys are listening into this because um, they were all sort of earing up to 
ask you plenty of HPC questions back in Corsicana <laughs> back in June, but we're 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 stopped at the first question. I'm afraid. Yeah, <laughs> we uh, we may get the last laugh yet, Anthony. And I was gonna say, uh, you bring up power. How fitting that power mining analysis is the name on the screen here. We might have to start calling these power hours, though, Anthony, because we've eaten up a full hour of Jason's time, which we greatly appreciate. So I just wanted to give you the mic one last time, Jason. Any closing thoughts? Any Thing on your mind we haven't asked you about and uh, thank you again on behalf of retail just for taking the time today yeah thank you guys for having me i, I appreciate the platform to talk through all of these things um it, it's always helpful to us to add this additional color there, there's so much that goes on to all of our businesses that uh having the ability to, to describe it in more detail and you know clarify things for people that, that that's really important for us and there's not many long form val uh platforms like this where we can really get that uh, across. You know, I think the last thing I want, want to get in is just once again, how excited uh, we are about the operational momentum that we have underway. The big thing for us has been narrowing that gap between deployed hash rate and operational hash rate. And because of the new deployments at Corsicana, and because of these big projects that are now running through at Rockdale through the end of the year, we think we are in a great spot to continue showing increase in uh, average operating hash rate month over month. And I think we're going to go into 2025 very, very strong. So it's um, a lot of irons in the fire to uh, accomplish this. You know, it's not just one big thing that's going on. There's all sorts of ways that we are optimizing to make, to, to get to that standard of operational excellence that, that we're, we have our eyes set on. And not just having strong operations, but we're doing everything in a safe and compliant way as well. The, um, the safety of our workers, you know, is is incredibly important as well. And uh, creating an environment for all of them to be successful and to grow and develop. That's a key thing that we focus on here at Riot as well. So I'm very excited about the momentum underway. We continue to show strong increases in Bitcoin production month over month driven by strong increases in average uh, operating hash rate month over month. And with all of the projects that we have underway, you know, we, we have our growth targets out there. We show the elements of those growth targets, but we have many projects that really haven't reached a level of certainty to be a part of those growth targets yet, our publicly st stated growth targets. Uh, but internally, we have a lot of things that we're working on. So very excited to share more about these as our confidence level on them increases and they crystallize and then they become a part of those 2025 or 2026 growth plans and beyond. There you go. Excellent. I can attest to the safety. Anthony and I still have our hard hats from our Corsicana tour. So safety first down there, how fitting we started with operational hash rate, which is up 16% month over month. That's where we're ending the conversation. Hopefully that trend continues, Jason. We look forward to having you back in the future. Congratulations on earnings, October production results, and obviously the progression you're seeing at Corsicana. So thanks again. You guys, if you're still watching, hit the like button. Feel free to subscribe. Let us know if you're holding shares of Riot in the comment section below and what you thought about the October numbers. That's all for now. We'll see you back here tomorrow.